thank you very much indeed. Uh, please take as an underlying argument all that Alex and Travis have said applies to this too, but I'm not going to talk either particularly about climate change or human population, uh, but clearly it will underline a lot of the other things that I'm talking about. So take that as a given. So what I'm talking about is loss of biodiversity on our increasingly crowded planet. We live in a world with a vast diversity of species in a wonderful array of wild areas, and you're all familiar with a lot of them. Um, I, as Margaret mentioned, I spent a lot of time living in Southeast Asia, so quite a few of my examples will be from there, but I'm trying to take this up another level to a more general argument about what's happening to the biodiversity in our world. Well, one of the things is we're in danger of losing some of the most charismatic species that we really care about. So in the past 10 years, we've already lost three subspecies of rhinos. In the whole of their natural range in Asia, we only have just over 3,000 tigers, um, and only about 1,000 of those are breeding females. To give you some comparison, there are about 5,000 tigers in Texas on ranches. Um, and there are about 6,000 in farms in China, but there are not many left in the wild. Over this 11-year period, we lost 65% of all of Africa's forest elephants. There's two species of uh, elephants now, everybody's decided in Africa. One is the savannah elephant, which is the one you're all most familiar with, and the other is the forest elephant. Uh, occurring in Central Africa, and that's just going down the tubes so fast. It's not just the big mammals, though. There's an organization called IUCN, uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature, which basically produces very scientifically based indices of what's happening to all the world's species. And this is for terrestrial vertebrates. This is the percentage of species that are threatened with extinction. So the highest is primates, more than half of all primates are threatened with extinction worldwide, followed by turtles and tortoises, uh, again, nearly uh, well over half, um, amphibians, uh, all mammals, and birds. Um, and the reason that birds are in somewhat better shape is because there are just a lot more species and a lot of them are more adapted to living with us. Uh, but there are still uh, more than one in 10 is threatened with extinction. <coughs> Uh, this isn't my area of expertise, but uh, world's fisheries are also in major decline for much of the same reasons, which I'll come on to, uh, both in terms of number of species out there and also in terms of abundance. So, why is this happening? Coming back to Travis, human population increase, that's his, his same graph there. There's just a heck of a lot more of us now. And that means that we take more resources, we use more primary energy, we, uh, cover, we just have a huge amount more impact, which we heard about. What does that mean for wild species? Well, if we look at over time, this is very, uh, very sort, of, uh, um, sort of cartoony graphical, but you started off before humans settled down at all with the world was full of natural ecosystems. Then we started to get into frontier ones. Then we got more into farming and now into very intensive agriculture, and during all that time, the amount of natural habitat has clearly decreased. We've got an increase in urban areas, increase in protected areas, uh, which I will also talk a little bit more about. But that's a key thing, is we're losing wild habitat. This is one that I was very familiar with in Southeast Asia, which is why I'm using it, is the spread of industrial oil palm. Oil palm is on in almost everything you eat or wash with, uh, it's, it's pretty ubiquitous, um, and it's, uh, it's incredibly productive. It's by far the most productive form of vegetable oil. It only grows in the humid tropics, which means that it's expanding at an enormous rate. And so in the last 50 years, we've lost more than half of all orangutan habitat, because specifically because of the spread of oil palm. Um, and the concern is that that will now spread to Central Africa and, and affect uh, great egg habitat there too. So this is a, a, a thing that was put together by some colleagues at the Wildlife Conservation Society a few years ago, looking at the human footprint uh, across the world. And this does it on things like lights at night, road density, human population density. And as you can see, 
Um, one of the reasons that I talk about Asia a lot, there is not much green left anywhere in Asia, or in Europe, or in the eastern US, or in, uh, or in eastern, uh, eastern Asia either. So um, broadly, we have had a huge impact on a very large amount of the planet. And that means there's just a lot less space for wildlife. Now, if you picture within those green areas, the other thing that we're doing is extracting resources from those remaining green areas. So they're not remaining intact, they are losing their, losing their resources. Whether we're talking about sharks and other fish in the sea, whether we're talking about ivory uh, because of poaching of elephants, whether we're talking about timber and other plant resources coming out of natural areas, whether we're talking about oil, natural gas, that sort of thing. So we, we use these wild areas as sources of products. And by doing so, we're going in there, uh, which means it's disrupting the habitat. It also means we tend to go in with guns and hunt things while we're there, and we bring in diseases while we're there. And so all of this means those green areas are nowhere near as green looking as they appear on the map. And uh, it's often on industrial scales. We're aware of that with fishing and logging, um, but also even in terms of things like uh, harvesting of wildlife now, those are bear paws uh, being um, sold. Uh, these are pangolins, scaly anteaters. That was one seizure of 23 tons of pangolins in Indonesia. So this is industrial scale, linked to criminal or organized crime, and often fueled by corruption. So again, this is it's just sucking a lot of wildlife out of wild areas, particularly in Africa and Asia. A third problem is invasive species. It surprised me when I first moved to the US quite a few years ago now that the US has one of the highest num percentage of threatened species on the planet. And you think, why? I mean, the eastern forests are coming back. You've got all the fabulous uh, lands out in the west. And the reason is Hawaii, um, because of invasive species such as mongooses and other invasive birds coming into Hawaii since the arrival of humans We've lost well over half, nearly two-thirds of all endemic bird species. Ten more are probably extinct. So you go to Hawaii, uh, you wander around Honolulu, you think you're in Southeast Asia because of all the species you see there, and you're just not seeing these native species like this, like this honey creeper. So that's another problem globally, particularly on islands. Invasives are particularly problematic on islands. Um, and another problem is disease. Uh, the reason for those two pictures is a large proportion of great apes across Central Africa have been wiped out by Ebola. We associate Ebola with humans, quite rightly, it's disastrous, uh, but it also, great apes get it as well. And one of the ways that humans' outbreaks sometimes start is by humans eating great apes who which Ebola infected. So that can be a big problem for wildlife. And so the fact that humans and wildlife are interacting more means these diseases are passing back to the detriment of both. Um, the other one is the amphibian crisis, which I'm sure you've all heard about, um, is uh, the chytrid fungus, so the little Panamanian frog, um, which, uh, again, they've been devastated by disease, which could be, it's not been proven yet, but could be linked to climate change. And a final thing which is causing problems is as we expand and our agricultural systems expand, uh, we're grazing cows in areas which have uh, jaguars, lions, tigers, and so uh, as people poach out the prey, then uh, these animals have no choice but to eat the cows that are now wandering into their land, and that causes people to retaliate and kill the things that kill their cows, which you can understand, but you get into a bit of a vicious cycle. So, why does it matter? Uh, this is a session on ethics, so why do we care? Firstly, it's just straight ethical reasons, and that's what motivates me to do what I do, is think of something as intelligent, 98% of genetic material sh shared with ourselves, such as the, the great apes, and some of these other highly social uh, creatures, why should they have less of a right to exist than we do? So there's just that straight ethical argument as species. Closely linked to that is the world's, a lot of the world's most impoverished, marginalized people are ones who depend entirely on natural systems and natural resources. They're the people that live in and around those green areas uh, for bushmeat, for their for fish, for 
for uh, their daily needs. And so if we lose those resources, these people get driven even closer to the wall. The next reason is ecological. These are these forest elephants that I talked about. Uh, what forest elephants do is they are engineers. They make these big clearings in the forest, which wouldn't be there without them, where they're digging for minerals, make paths in the forest. They keep the forest healthy uh, for a lot of other species. And all species have such roles, whether as predators, uh, herbivores, dispersers, pollinators, um, then it keeps the system as a whole functioning. And I don't have the time to get into this now, but intact forests are going to be one of the other ways that we are going to be able to mitigate climate change because it needs all these processes. And that feeds into uh, ecosystem services of these intact systems. They act as water catchments, they act as disease management, uh, all these different things, uh, as well as just uh, for their aesthetic value. Um, but one example is there's a national park in Rwanda uh, which provides about $285 million worth of ecosystem services per year. It basically provides the entire water catchment for Kigali, the capital, and most of the rest of the country. Uh, this was a fellow that I studied for many years. Uh, this was just one other ecosystem um, uh, example. Uh, these guys live only in mangrove forests, only in Borneo, in Southeast Asia, uh, just across from Singapore there. And uh, we worked out that the value of one not particularly large uh, mangrove reserve, it supported fisheries worth more than $20 million a year, about 3,000 jobs and tourism. And it was more than 10 times the value of if you converted it to oil palm. Now, the reason I wanted it kept was to save those wonderful monkeys. But the reason we got politically got it saved was for all of those reasons. Um, economic and, uh, and employment reasons. Uh, for example, Eastern Africa, somewhere like Tanzania, 17% of all GDP comes directly from wildlife tourism, and it's, a, it's the single major source of, of, of jobs and income to the country. So finally, what can we actually do? What can we do about this? First of all, we can create national parks. They're good for people, they're good for wildlife, for all the reasons that we've given. First national park in the world ever was Yellowstone, and it's proven the model for the whole of the rest of the world. So this is a map of current protected areas around the world, blue ones in the oceans are green. This doesn't include the latest ones declared last year by President Obama over in Hawaii and on the East Coast, but it's, it's, it's fairly up to date. And the green ones are uh, terrestrial, obviously. One of the things that's really important uh, is to involve local communities in those protected areas so that they become a part of it and they become a part of the management system and that's the only way it's going to be really sustainable. So this is a park that um, we were, uh, our colleagues were involved in helping protect in Madagascar, Anton Gil Bay. Uh, the reason we were particularly interested is it's a major carving ground for humpback whales. But also it's really important for local people for fisheries. So by involving them and protecting their fisheries, their fisheries income and quantity of fisheries has gone up enormously. So they're benefiting and they're helping us to protect the whales. Once you've got those protected areas, uh, you have to manage them. So getting back to our forest elephants here, um, they, they basically are shown in areas where eco guards, the guards that are patrolling, which normally come from local communities, uh, where they're absent, you get this number of elephants, and you get more than f about five times as many elephants in places where it's being well protected. And you can put a lot of science into this, I won't get into too much detail, but basically take a GPS system and the rangers go around on patrols, um, tracking where they're going. They note down every time they see a sign of poaching or a sign of elephants or a sign of anything else that they're looking for. Then that gets put into a map, which then feeds back into where they patrol. And this system now, called the smart system of patrolling, is now being adopted by national parks all around the world. There's some countries where it's, it's it's legal in all national parks to have this sort of patrolling system, and it's proving to be very, very effective at protecting animals. So here was one of the first places it was tried in Thailand. Um, when it first started, this area down the side of the reserve was where there were patrols, and a few years later, that's where there were patrols, and the number of tigers has gone up 
uh, exactly as you would expect with that. Similarly, here in Central Africa, with our forest elephants again, the uh, number of elephants has gone up where we've got these sort of long-term enforcement programs as opposed to all the areas around the outside. So this is what you need to do on the ground um, with local communities, with local rangers, is, is get national parks, get them protected. Um, but we also need to work at other levels as well. We need to get political support. We need to do the sorts of things that Alex is doing um, and uh, getting to the top. So for elephants, one of the things that happened a couple of years ago, less than a couple of years ago now, was uh, in order to stop the ivory trade, to stop this hemorrhaging of elephants from Africa, um, President Obama and President Xi Jinping both agreed to close down their domestic ivory markets because they were big domestic ivory markets which was drawing elephants out of Africa. The United States has now done it. China has now done closed most of its markets at the end of last month and they're going to close the whole lot by the end of this year. So we need to get some agreements at that level too, particularly given the amount of corruption involved in some of this stuff. And finally, just down the road here at the UN, the Sustainable Development Goals, which all countries of the world have signed on to, uh, emphasize the importance of doing lots of things, addressing climate change, addressing population, but also of protecting biodiversity. And the uh, call at the start of that is to live in a world where humanity lives in harmony with nature and which wildlife and other living species are protected. So that's calling uh, a worldwide call to, to protect um, these systems. Finally, just to say we need to monitor what's happening. We can't just assume that if we do the right things that wildlife is surviving. We need to be out there counting them, monitoring them on land and uh, on, uh, on sea and on land. These are camera traps, uh, which is the way you sensors tigers. Is you put a camera up, tiger walks through it, takes a photograph of itself, um, and that's our team in India setting that up. And then you can individually identify them by their stripes. And then you can say what's happening to tiger populations <laughs> around the world. Mm. And that's a tiger who clearly didn't like the camera trap. Mm. <laughs> Finally, uh, just to uh, put out there, just a couple of final thoughts uh, as an as a ethical thing, is is urbanization the answer on this? <laughs> it's taking, this is, these are all continents of the world. The world is becoming more urbanized over time. Um, and as the world is becoming more urbanized, there's World Bank, WHO figures showing in general, and this is a huge generalization, but it's, it's a good trend. As we become more urbanized, not only does that take direct people off the land, in cities people tend per capita to use less energy um, because they're more energy efficient. We're all living in a place like this. Um, it also tends to mean that women have better education, which tends to make them more environmentally aware. And it uh, and general extreme poverty declines. So there's lots of reasons why there's benefits to living in well-governed cities, and potentially this might help us get over this bottleneck that we're going to in lots of biodiversity. And then finally, just a very famous uh, statement by Mahatma Gandhi: Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, but not enough for every man's greed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. just think. Can we leave a place for wild species in our very crowded planet? Thank you.